Hey everyone, my name is Philip Walden. I'm an engineer on the Chrome team working on web performance and service worker tooling. And I'm Eva, I'm also an engineer on the Chrome team. Today we're going to talk about service worker from the speed and resilience perspective. We look into how our decisions regarding service worker implementation can influence both positively and negatively our site's performance. And we hope that by the end of this talk, you'll have a really good understanding of all the trade-offs involved in um, using this more and more mainstream technology. So Eva, I noticed you said Service Worker was mainstream. What makes you say that? Well, Service Worker is now supported in all modern browsers, which means you can move from treating it as a pure progressive enhancement and treat it as a core part of your site's architecture. Service Worker can do many things, but in this talk, we'll focus especially on its caching capabilities. Often when we think about Service Worker and caching, we usually associate it with providing offline support. After all, one of the main achievements of Service Worker was that we finally could get rid of the offline down Azor and, you know, send him to the well-deserved retirement. But apart from that, Service Worker can also be a great tool for improving the performance of your online site, especially for your returning users. When used right, it can give you a serious boost in terms of speed on a repeated visit. That's right. And on the other hand, when used incorrectly or without proper analysis, it can actually hamper a site's performance or even derail the whole experience altogether. So as developers, it's critical that we understand how a service worker affects the performance of our site. As with any technology, there are both costs and benefits, and we want to maximize the benefits while minimizing the cost. Well, using Service Worker brings a lot of benefits in terms of performance. In many cases, it allows you to overcome the network latency entirely. For example, if you cache your entire app, you don't need to go to the network anymore. Also, if you have some cached content, you can show it immediately, even if a bit stale, and look for the updates in the background at the same time. It can also make your average request smaller on average. For example, in the upshell model, where you're fetching just partial part of your page rather than the full HTML each time. Finally, there are some more subtle benefits. For example, we know that JavaScript needs to be parsed, compiled, and executed uh, before it can be used. This can take time. So engines like V8 use some heuristics uh, to see if they can actually store the bytecode from these phases to be used on a repeated visit to avoid this cost. Now, in Service Worker, the chances of a repeated visit are pretty high, so it can opt in into that optimization automatically for you. This means that it stores the scripts as bytecode by default, making the repeated visits faster. All these are really good performance reasons to implement Service Worker on your page. But it's not for free. Phil, what are the costs of running Service Worker on your page? Yeah, so the first and arguably most often overlooked cost of Service Worker is that it can take time for the Service Worker process to start up if it's not already running. And this can happen if a user hasn't visited your, your site in a while. Let me show you what I mean. Consider a basic network-first strategy in which the Service Worker just forwards the request from the web app onto the network and doesn't touch the cache at all. Since this web app, web app is running a service worker, every request then has to go through that service worker. And if the service worker process isn't currently running, the web app has to wait for the browser to spin it up before it can make any request. So let's take a look at the total time it takes to make a request in various scenarios. In the case where the web app isn't using service worker, the total time is just the total network latency. In the case where the web app is using service worker and that service worker is already running, there's a little bit of extra cost because it has to go through the service worker, the request has to go through the service worker, but that cost isn't usually too high. However, in the case where the service worker is not running and needs to boot up, that startup time can really delay the response. So in cases like this where the service worker is actually not running on a page, how long does it usually take to boot up? So that's a good question. And the honest answer is it depends on the user's device. But fortunately, there's an easy way you can measure this cost yourself. So this code here uses the performance timeline to get performance data for a particular URL. If the request for the URL went through the service worker, then the worker start property on the performance entry will mark the moment right before the service worker was run. 
and the request start property will mark the moment the service worker received the fetch event. So the difference between these two timestamps is the total time it took for the worker to start up. And if the service, per service worker process was already running, this time will be usually zero or close to zero. And so I actually measure service worker setup time on my website, philipwalden.com, and here's what I found when looking at my own data. When a user visits my site for the first time, or sorry, for the first time after installing the service worker, it's already running only about 25% of the time. That means 75% of the time the service worker is not running and needs to take some time to start up. For those cases, um, I found that on desktop, it's usually between 20 and 100 milliseconds to start up. But on mobile, it can be more like 100 to 500 milliseconds. And at the 95th percentile, sometimes it's more than a second. So let me reiterate, these are stats from my website. The numbers you see might be different, um, but this should give you kind of a general idea of what's possible. Another cost of using Service Worker is that the cache reads aren't always instant. And this affects any caching strategy where the Service Worker has to wait for the cache to either miss or error before it can go to the network. We saw before that a network-first strategy can be slow when you're not using Service Worker at all. But what about strategies that use cache, or start with the cache anyway? A cache for strategy will initially look for a response in the cache, and if one isn't found, if one is found, it'll be used. But if it's not found, or there's a timeout or error, like I mentioned, it will fall back to the network. So here's how the performance of cache for strategies break down in different scenarios. The most common case is going to be the one at the top, which is very fast when there's a cache hit. But this is not the only possibility. There could also be a cache miss. There could be a slow cache. You could have a timeout. Remember, there's also the possibility that the service worker isn't running, and so then that could delay it as well. All of these bad cases could happen at the same time. So while it's definitely possible to have a cache-first strategy that's faster than not using a service worker, look at how many of these examples end up being slower. So Phil, I'm wondering how likely is it that this slow uh, cases actually occur? Is it measurable somehow? Yeah, so this is also measurable. Um, it's a little bit trickier than the last example I was showing. So this, um, the same way, uses the performance timeline. And uh, you can look at the entry's transfer size property. If the transfer size is 0, then that means the request either came from the cache or came from the service worker. For requests that you know are being handled by the service worker, because you set up a route for that URL, you can look at the time between the response start property and the request start property um, and see like the total strategy time. Of course, that doesn't tell you if it was just handled by the cache or if it was handled by the cache and the network. If you need more granular timing data into that um, stuff, then you have to add these performance marks kind of in your service worker itself. You can use something like performance.now um, and then post message this data back to the window. It's a bit clunky at the moment, to be honest. Um, but we have a new API proposal for fetch event worker timing that should make this easier in the future. And um, it is a proposal right now. So if you want to offer feedback on the design, go to this um, short link here on the slide. Um, and um, we'd love your, your feedback, and you can chime in. So the last cost that we want to point out is that requests made from within the service worker can sometimes compete with higher priority requests uh, on the window. And this, the cause of this is usually over-aggressive pre-caching or pre-caching before the window has finished loading all of its resources. So for example, if you're pre-caching literally every single asset on your website, um, you could potentially get into a situation where those pre-cached requests get queued ahead of more important requests that the user needs. So while APIs like Priority Hints can solve this issue somewhat, the recommended approach right now is just to wait to register your service worker until after the load event. OK, thanks, Phil, for the thorough walkthrough through the costs. So once we know all this and we know how to measure it, how does this translate into the design of service worker? Well, usually, there are three sources the service worker gets content from, either from network, either from the cache, or it can also generate it on the fly, for example, by using some you know, templating logic. When designing service worker, your role is to find a combination of these three sources that is the most efficient for the use cases on your web pages. This is the serving strategy of service worker. Of course, in order to use anything from the cache, we need to populate it first with the resources first. And this is the caching strategy of service worker. Taking all these aspects into account can be quite daunting, but fortunately, there are tools that make it easier. For example, Workbox is a set of libraries that make it easy to cache assets and take advantage of service worker features and related APIs. In this talk, 
We'll focus on the general design principles that you can implement yourself in Service Worker, but we will also call out some of the workbox features that can help you out in some common scenarios. OK, so let's start with looking at the serving strategies for Service Worker implementations. And given what we said about the costs that can be associated with using Service Worker, you're probably wondering, is it possible to avoid these costs entirely and make sure that my site actually loads faster than it would have without the Service Worker? So the first and arguably most important step in building a fast site with Service Worker is an understanding of which requests are most important to optimize. So broadly speaking, there are two types of requests, navigation requests and resource requests. Navigation requests are for your full HTML pages, and resource requests are for the assets like JavaScript, CSS, and uh, images that those pages then reference. So in my experience with talking to other developers about service worker implementations, I found that most people are generally pretty good at responding to resource requests from the cache. But unfortunately, I don't see a lot of people responding to uh, navigation requests from the cache. And that's really too bad, because navigation requests are typically where the biggest performance gains can be made. So here's why. The key difference between resource requests and navigation requests is that navigation requests are likely already being cached by the browser. Uh, in addition, you can already use APIs like link rel preload to warm the HTTP cache for future requests. So if all your service worker is doing is pre-caching static resources, you're essentially just recreating what the browser is already doing for you. Navigation requests, on the other hand, are completely different. In general, it's not recommended to put caching headers on pages that you navigate to because you know, obviously the content might change, but the URL doesn't, and so that can get you into trouble which means that navigation requests don't benefit from the HTTP cache in the same way that resource requests do. They also don't work with APIs like link rel preload. And to top all that off, navigation requests are typically the ones that will encounter a service worker that's not running, uh, whereas resource requests, by the time the service worker starts up from navigation requests, it's already running, and so those kind of work just fine. So don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that you ignore resource requests and don't cache them. You should cache them because that can give you more control, and you can get the bytecode optimization that Ava mentioned. But what I am suggesting is that if you want your site to be as fast as possible, as possible, you have to respond to navigation requests from the cache as well. So here are three practical and concrete ways you can speed up navigation requests and avoid most of the service worker costs that I mentioned earlier. First, as I just said, respond to navigation requests from the cache. Even if you eventually need to go to the network, you should respond with something right away so the, the user understands that, that it's happening, that the request is working. A simple way to do this with Workbox is to use either a cache-first strategy or a stale while revalidate strategy. Personally, I like stale while revalidate because it gives you an opportunity to check for updates in the background, and then you can notify the user if there's new content. And in terms of performance, as you can see, responding from the cache is generally faster when not using a service worker. And that's even true in cases where the service worker is asleep and needs to start up or in cases where the cache is slow. Uh, the only situation it's worse is when there's a cache miss and you have to go to the network anyway. But that's to be expected. So I know what many of you here are probably thinking. There's absolutely no way that I can respond to all network requests, uh, navigation requests, with cache content. I need my content to be up to date. I need it to be fresh. And this is true. Many apps just simply cannot provide value with stale content. They have to have fresh content. But just because you need to fetch something from the cache or from the network doesn't mean that you need to fetch the entire HTML page from the network. So my second tip is that when the network content is truly required, fetch just the minimum amount of content you need, and then combine that content with other parts of the page, which should already be in the cache. And even better is if you can combine that content in the form of a streaming response to the user. So let me show you an example of what I mean by that. A lot of HTML pages have a structure that looks something like this. You have kind of a head section, a header, navigation, sidebar, footer, and a lot of these sections of the page repeat on every single page throughout your site. The only thing that changes is often a single content area, like you can see here. So in these types of situations, clearly it's more efficient to just fetch the stuff that's changed rather than fetching all of that stuff every time. If you've ever built a single page application, you're probably kind of familiar with this concept, though the streaming part might be new to you. So here's a visualization of the performance breakdown between, between traditional network responses and a streaming response that combines network content with cache content. So in the example on top, uh, since the network request is for the full HTML page, you can see it takes a long time. 
And in the example on the bottom, the network request is for a smaller part of the HTML, and so there's less data to be transferred, so it will typically take less time. In addition, the cache content can be fetched in parallel with the network content, so it doesn't add to the total time it takes to make the request. And lastly, and this is the best part about streaming, since it is a stream, we don't have to wait until all the content is available to start sending something to the user. As soon as we have the cache content from the start of the page, the header section, we can send it to the user right away, and then we can just add to the stream once we get more network content in later. So the overall experience is a much faster time to first byte, and then a faster time overall as well. If you've never used streams before, you might be a little bit scared of the idea. You might think it's complicated. But actually, with Workbox, it's really easy. So what you do is you, you know, just register a route like you would do with any Workbox strategy. And then you invoke the strategy function from the Workbox streams package. The strategy function takes an array of other Workbox strategies. And each of these is expected to resolve to a response that you then stitch together, and Workbox stitches it together in the form of a stream. In this case, I'm using uh, cache first for the, the header part and the footer part, and then I'm using network first for the content so I can make sure that it's fresh. And, and that's really it. Workbox takes care of merging this content together in a stream, and if the browser doesn't support streams, it automatically falls back to a single text response. And because the strategy requests less content from the network, and because it can read from the cache in parallel, it's typically quite a bit faster than the no service worker case. Of course, the actual speed differences will depend on you know, the size of the content area relative to the entire HTML page, and that will vary from site to site. But in general, streaming cache content with network content is one of the fastest ways to respond to navigation requests. And I say one of the fastest ways because there actually is one more optimization that we can make to get this even faster. So the last technique for speeding up navigations that I want to talk about is a new API called Navigation Preload, which allows you to make the navigation request in parallel with the service worker starting up, essentially eliminating that service worker boot up cost that I mentioned before. So by now, you've probably seen this uh, chart many times. You understand that the boot service worker boot up time can extend the navigation request. So with navigation preload, what you do is you just do these requests in parallel. And the way that this works is the browser sends the, or sets this navigation worker, um, sorry, this service worker navigation preload header on the preload request. And then that allows your server to respond to this request as it would have had the request come directly from the service worker itself. So for example, if you're using the streaming partials strategy that I just discussed, you could respond to the navigation preload request the same as you would have if it had come from the service worker. To use navigation preload, uh, it's relatively easy. All you have to do is uh, enable it. You probably want to feature detect it first, but then you enable it. Um, at any point in the lifecycle, really, but it's often best to do it in the activate event. And then once you've enabled it, fetch events for navigation requests will have access to a preload response property, which you can then use however you want. And then looking at the performance of this technique, you'll see how navigation um, requests with preload, with navigation preload, are even faster than the already fast streaming example. Um, and you know, one last thing I want to say about navigation preload is that you really only want to use it in cases where you, you know you're going to have to make a navigation request, or sorry, a network request on navigations. Um, if you can use just the cache first strategy to respond to navigations, then that ends up being faster, and then you waste the network request. Um, so in general, only use it if you know that you have to use uh, content from the network. So to summarize everything I've said so far, uh, even though there are definitely some costs associated with using Service Worker, with a proper serving strategy, you can easily overcome these costs, and you can end up with an even faster loading site than what you could have done without Service Worker. OK. Now let's talk a bit about the caching part of the Service Worker. When we think about cache management, we usually want to achieve the following. We want to store the right resources at the right time while controlling the overall size of our application. We definitely want to prevent quota overflow, because as developers, we do have quite a bit of storage space on user's device, but it's not unlimited, so we need to stick to that. And we also want our resources to be as fresh as possible, which means we need to have efficient updates. Now, when it comes to right resources, it's good to understand what you actually want to put in the cache in the first place. Resources are a little bit like food, you know? There are the critical ones, really important ones, 
like some HTML, uh, core scripts, or basic styles. This should really get the highest priority in terms of cache. Then there are non-critical ones. For example, uh, images that are not visible straight away, or some big media files, or some additional widgets. We cache them on a best effort basis. And finally, there's trash, which means stuff that should not be there in the first place. This is, this is the bloat, the unnecessary parts of your page, like unoptimized images, dead code, unused script, and so on. Why do we have trash on our pages? Well, because we're humans, and sometimes our projects are simply not perfect. This moment, when you're considering how to shape your caching strategy for service worker, is a great time to stop for a while, make an audit of your page, and get rid of all that unnecessary parts before they end up clogging your user's um, device. So reviewing your app and understanding which resources are critical and which are not so critical will really help you later in designing and updating your cache in an efficient manner. Now, what about timing? Usually, we cache assets either in the install event of Service Worker, that's usually pre-caching, or later during the runtime of our application. Let's compare these two. So pre-caching is very similar to installing a ready-made package with your app. It's great for caching the critical content, since we know it's most probably going to be needed anyways. It's relatively easy to implement and to manage, and to update because you can just you know, replace the whole package with the new version when needed, and also because the size of such package is known beforehand. On the other hand, when using pre-caching, you need to make a lot of arbitrary decisions about what your user is going to need even before they start interacting with the page, which might lead to the situation where you cache uh, many more resources than necessary. Also, as Phil mentioned before, it can cause network congestion and compete with the other network requests from the window. Runtime caching, on the other hand, is really great for non-critical assets because we you can draw conclusions from your user's behavior. For example, cache only images they already accessed or show different, cache different parts of your app depending on the user's entry point. On the other hand, the problem with runtime is that you need to be really careful about updates because assets might end up in cache at different moments in time. For example, if resources depend on each other, like you have a script that depends on markup, and you end up caching incompatible versions of them, you run into trouble. So you need to be really careful about versioning. Also, important thing is that in this case, the cache will grow over time. It's, the size is not known beforehand. So the user, as the user interacts with the app, the uh, size will be different. Here's an example. This is a very simple e-commerce app I built recently. If I cache pages in this app at runtime and the home page is fully cached, it takes about 150 kilobytes with all the images. But later, when the user navigates to a new category, like accessories page, it gets added to the cache, and the overall size grows to 300 kilobytes. And so on and so on. As the user interacts with my app, the overall size grows. If the app is really big, it might be really hard to predict ahead of time how much space it will take on user's device. This is why it's so important to control the size of your app throughout the runtime. Uh, Phil, can we do it programmatically somehow? You can. Um, if you ever need to check the, your app's current kind of storage usage, you can use the Storage Manager API, which has an estimate method that returns both the total quota as well as the current amount that's being used. Well, it's really cool that we can estimate that because it allows us to proactively control the app size and prevent quota overflow. Quota is limited and depends both on user's device and also on the amount of currently available space on the device. So you can't just throw assets into the cache and assume it will never fill up. You always need to have a plan on how to remove old or unnecessary assets. After all, you don't want a situation where you can't update some critical script because your cache is full of you know, cat videos. Here are some things that can help you to stay below the quota. As we mentioned before, you can store partials of your pages instead of full HTML to avoid duplication and save some space. 
You can also separate your critical and non-critical assets into different caches with different names, so that you can evict the non-critical ones when needed without touching the rest. Finally, you can also cache some resources only if there is plenty of space, like conditionally. Or you can put size or maximum number of entries constraints on your cache. I think this is something Workbox can help us with. Yeah, with Workbox, you can easily manage uh, the rules for how and when cache entries should expire with the cache expiration plugin. And you can use it with any of the Workbox strategies. So you configure both a max number of entries per cache or a max age for each entry. You can also configure um, the plugin to automatically purge all, event, all entries if there's any kind of quota error or anything like that, which is usually a good thing to do when you have a non-critical asset cache. OK, now a few words about updating the cache. The simplest solution is what I call the, the nuke approach, which means you clear all your caches and start fresh every time your service worker updates. It's very easy to implement, but it's not very efficient nor kind to your users' data plans. So you should be more granular about what you update and when. And if you want to be more granular, uh, you need to properly tag your assets so that you know which ones are compatible with each other. You can use the content-based hashes in the file name of the given resource, or provide revision data on each asset so that you can manage it in Service Worker later on. This process can be very error-prone when done manually, so fortunately, we have tools to help with that as well. Yeah, with the Workbox, workbox pre-caching package, you don't have to manually um, manage the update process yourself at all. It has an asset manifest that maps file URLs to their revision has hashes, um, and that allows it to remove old assets and fetch new ones without having to touch any of the unchanged assets. It makes the upgrade process really efficient. Uh, Workbox also has both Gulp and Webpack plugins, and as well as a CLI, so you can easily generate this asset manifest yourself. As you can see, Workbox makes a lot of things easier for us as developers, so that we can focus on what matters most, and that's the user. And you know, users can really vary. They can, come of, they can be of different background. They can use our app at home or on the go. Um, they can use more or less advanced devices or have different access to data and connectivity. There are some things we can do to accommodate those differences. First of all, when working on performance, never assume the environment you work in is representative of your whole user base. For example, you should always throttle your network to 3G speed when testing to get a more realistic feel for your app performance. Secondly, keep in mind those underpowered devices with little storage and really control the size of your app. Remember that the overall size of your app might grow over time if you use runtime caching and plan accordingly. Also, sometimes there are actually explicit hints from the user that you can use in your decision making. For example, you can refrain from speculatively pre-caching future resources if the data saver mode is turned on. When user enables this feature in Chrome, the save data header is being sent with each request, so you can detect it and, for example, refrain from aggressively pre-caching a lot of future assets. Similarly, you can use the Network Information API effective type method to differentiate your strategy based on the current network condition of the user. Finally, you can also consider scenarios where you give the user the full control over the experience. For example, you provide save for later button where user can explicitly opt in and decide to get something stored for future use. Putting the user first can really benefit the quality of your app, especially in the long-term development horizon. So to wrap up, I know we've presented a lot of content today, and we don't expect you to remember everything. If you want to learn more about service worker best practices, we've launched a new section on web.dev with content dedicated to building fast and resilient web applications with service worker. So definitely check that out. Uh, also, we've just released a v4 beta of Workbox with lots of cool new features. Um, and we'd love your feedback on GitHub before the public release. And finally, just a few key points we want to leave you with. First. Definitely have a plan. You can't just assume that adding service worker to a site will magically make it faster, uh, because without an optimization plan, it probably won't. Second, don't just reinvent the HTTP cache inside of your service worker. Uh, and don't just cache static resources. If that's all you're doing, you're not actually optimizing your site for service worker, and you might even be making it slower. <laughs>
Third, remember that navigation requests are the most important requests to optimize, and you should always try to respond to them from the cache. Fourth, measure the real user performance of your implementations and make future performance decisions based on data. Don't just guess. Fifth, control the size of your app and how much you store on the user's device. And last, but definitely not least, respect the user, respect their data, and respect their preferences. So thank you. If you have any questions, feel free to find either of us afterwards, um, or hit us up on Twitter and ask questions. Um, that's it, yeah. Thank you.